It's the Adam Ragusea Podcast, episode 66, and I ask you, is this the good part? What are the good times that we're all working toward in our lives? What's the reward at the end of this journey? Does it even exist? I report to you now from the frontiers of happiness, where I am fortunate enough to live thanks to you, dear listener. I am financially secure. I work for myself, doing the creative work I want to do. I live in my dream house, which came with a greenhouse, where I'm recording the pod these days, even though it's a little reverberant, but it's just a nicer place to spend an hour. I have a beautiful and loving family. We just came back from our annual dream vacation to Florida's Emerald Coast, where the built environment is just soulless sprawl, but the beaches themselves are second to none, and we stay right on the beach. I just got back from that vacation. When we got home, my biggest concern was watering this pot of green bean sprouts, which had gotten a little bit dry. I report to you from the frontiers of happiness. And I want to tell you what it's like here. Not to brag, but because I thought you'd be interested to know that the frontiers of happiness are not really what I expected them to be. And given that you're probably trying to reach these very shores yourself, I thought you'd want to know what it's like. At least from my point of view. Which is, of course, the only point of view that I can, you know view. I've talked about this on the pod before, but that was an episode chiefly about money. This episode is going to be chiefly about feelings. When all the big problems in your life are solved, when there's nothing major that's wrong, what happens next? Is this when you finally get to unclench? You win the marathon, and what do you want to do next, now that you don't have to run any farther? What do you want? You want to sit down? Does sitting down feel as good as you expect it to in the miserable middle of the marathon? What's the good part? What are we running toward? Is this it? Is this all there is? Is this as good as it gets? Because, of course, even when you're doing exactly what you want to do, like taking your family on a beach vacation or hanging out inside your greenhouse, even when you're doing exactly what you think you want to be doing, lots of stuff happens that you don't like. Lots of stuff happens that doesn't feel good. Nobody likes the drive down to the beach. (laughs) Eight hours in the car on the boring soulless United States interstate highway system where you see nothing interesting. You got the kids fighting in the back, arguing the whole time over who gets the Nintendo Switch for the next five minutes or whatever. I get super car sick, no surprise there. And I had a video to edit on the drive down on my laptop while Lauren drove. And so I got super car sick looking down at my screen the whole drive. That wasn't so bad, because that was a problem that had to do with work. And so I was able to blame my dissatisfaction and my discomfort in that moment on an external force. The imperative to continue to work to make a living. The particular short-term obligations that I made to sponsors and such to finish editing that video that day in that car when I really should have been focused on looking out the window to keep from getting car sick. The good thing about having problems in your life is that you can blame all of your bad feelings, all of your unhappiness and your discomfort. You can blame that on the problems. You figure, hey, I feel terrible right now, but that's not because of me. It's because of my job or whatever. As soon as I can quit my job, I won't feel bad anymore. And fair enough, right? Lots of people, perhaps most working people in this world, work 
terrible jobs. Like, maybe a few people really do enjoy sewing socks in a Bangladeshi sweatshop, and maybe most of the people sewing those socks prefer their job to whatever they would realistically be doing to make a living instead, but most people sewing those socks probably still hate their job. I've never had a job as unpleasant as I imagine that job to be, but I've had a few messy, hot, hard jobs in my day, enough to know how ridiculously lucky I am that this is my job now, sitting in my greenhouse, contemplating the meaning of life with all of you people. This right here is my high-paying job, and that fact is bananas. B-A-N-A-N-S. Bananas. I know how lucky I am, and I will tell you the honest truth that my quote-unquote job does still feel like a job. Most days when it's time to make the donuts, as it were, most times when I settle in to do the thing that I do on the internet to make money come out the other end, I'd really rather not do it, if I'm being honest. I like developing recipes and I like researching topics that I'm curious about and I like playing with cameras and microphones and lights and stuff. I really like hanging around farms. I really like making things. But most of the time, I'd rather just go feed my fish or play my drums. No matter what work is, work still feels like work. Which isn't really a problem when you have a crappy job. Like you expect your crappy job to feel like a job. You expect to not want to go. But you go to work anyway because you have to. And you figure, hey, even if it's eight hours of misery, it still provides me with a living. My crappy job provides for the other 16 hours of my day in which I can do whatever I want. So, fair trade. But when you have your dream job and you still don't want to go to work, you are presented with some really weird and uncomfortable questions. Like, is there something fundamentally wrong with me where I can't be happy even when handed all of the tools for happiness on a silver platter? At this point, dear listener, you may be losing your patience with me. You may be thinking, oh, please... If I hit it big on YouTube, I'd be chilling like a villain. You'd never see me without a smile on my face again. Dude, that's what I thought too. I thought this would fix everything about me. And it fixed a whole lot, but not everything. And now, sometimes I find myself wondering, am I constitutionally unable to be happy for any extended length of time. That is a terrifying thought, right? Is there something fundamentally wrong with me where even my dream job feels like a chore? Or is there something fundamentally wrong with jobs? That's a slightly less uncomfortable question, so let's explore that one first. I think it's possible that jobs of any kind just suck. That's why it's a job. That's why somebody pays you to do it. They pay you to do it because they don't want to do it themselves. Perhaps work inherently sucks. If it didn't suck, then it wouldn't be work. It would be play. I think there's some truth to that explanation that we just sketched out, but it can't be the whole truth. Because if work inherently sucks, then why do we do it in our spare time when no one is paying us? You know, hobbies. If it's so awful to sew socks for a living, why do so many people do it for fun? Like, knitting is one of the most popular hobbies in the world. If it's so awful to slave over a hot stove all day, why do so many of us spend our days at work fantasizing about what we're going to cook when we get home? The obvious answer is 
because when we sew socks in our spare time, we get to wear them. (laughs) When we cook in our spare time, we get to eat it at the end. At your job, you have to give your work product away for someone else to consume. I mean, you don't give it away, you, you sell it, hence commerce, but That's not even close to being the whole truth either, because I love cooking for other people, and I suspect you do too. I don't like sewing other people's socks, but other people really like sewing other people's socks. Hence all the hand-knit socks and scarves and such that I've been gifted over the years, and I've jammed into that drawer where you put stuff that you're never going to use, but you can't throw it away either, so the drawer... If we don't like working, then why do we work even when we don't have to? My older brother, Dr. Tony Ragusia, is a clinical psychologist at a community hospital in a beautiful little town in Pennsylvania. He has this gorgeous historic house downtown, beautiful wife, beautiful child, and when he comes home at the end of the day, he just works even more. Go into Tony's basement, and it's like that guy is running four different companies down there. There's his woodworking business. He carves these cutting boards that are, unfortunately, too visually interesting for me to use on camera in my videos. They would distract from the thing that I'm trying to show people, but they're beautiful handmade cutting boards that verge into being art objects, and Tony carves them and he sells them. He has his photography business. Tony is really much better with technology than I am, always has been. And he takes outstanding photographs. Lately, he's moved into doing these like arty, ultra long exposure photos that he sells in galleries and stuff. He'll set up a long exposure and then he'll fly his kite in the frame, resulting in a ghostly, swishy after image. Tony also flies kites really seriously. Those like hard to fly stunt kites. And then there's his kayaks and his gardens, incredibly extensive gardens at Tony's house, vegetables, fruits, ornamentals, bonsai. He raises tiny trees, bonsai. So many hobbies and side hustles on which he slaves day and night. Surely not for the money, Or the produce. The man is a staff doctor at a hospital. He's Dr. Ragusia. He doesn't need to wear down his fingers sanding hand-carved cutting boards in his basement. And yet he does. Why? I've never really understood my brother. And I don't think that he's ever really understood me. The way that he and I enjoy life or not just seems fundamentally different in some way that we still don't understand after 41 years of knowing each other. The mystery of hobbies could be explained as simply saying people don't like to be bossed around. I mean, some people like to be bossed around, but probably most of us want to do what we choose to do most of the time, not when somebody else tells us to do. A hobby may look like a job, swim like a job, quack like a job, but it's still work that you choose for yourself and you can stop doing it whenever you want. So we think of it as a leisure activity, even if the reality of it is is anything but. My current job, making videos about food on YouTube, that started as a hobby and I don't have a boss telling me what to do. But it's how I make my living And the need to make a living is its own boss. My obligations to my audience and to my business associates. Obligation is its own boss. And if you start to make some real money, avarice becomes its own boss. I said this in the episode that was about money. And I said just now that this episode was going to be about feelings, not money. But let me tell you one really important thing that I have learned about money. Everybody who starts making real money learns this lesson. Greed can easily become the worst boss that you've ever had. When you find that you can afford a 
bigger house and various luxuries, you naturally are drawn to them, but then you find that you have to work harder and longer to maintain all of your luxuries, and you are no longer on easy street. You are no longer secure. Luxury is not the best part of having money. Security is the best part of having money. Therefore, you ought not sacrifice financial security for luxury. Sometimes I think we, we could have just stayed in our tiny house in Macon that we had before the YouTube thing happened. I probably could have retired there after working this job for a few more years. But it's not like we went hog wild with the new house. The new house is super nice, but it's in a cheap city. Our mortgage here would have bought us a tiny condo with zero outdoor space in our old neighborhood in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Anyway, I don't have a human boss, but I have a boss. And so my job still isn't really a choice. If I want to continue providing for my family the way that I have been, I must keep me making YouTube videos about food or some such. That obligation is my boss. Maybe the feeling of obligation is the big difference between a job and a hobby. But of course, the freedom of a hobby also changes the substance of the work, not just the feeling, right? Like if my brother, Tony, made cutting boards for a living, he probably wouldn't make a totally different design every time the way he does now. He'd probably have like a set template that consumers like, and he can easily mass produce. Making the same cutting board every time would probably be a lot less fun and less interesting for him than designing and hand carving whatever strikes his fancy that day. And he'd have to make way more cutting boards than he makes now. Making one cutting board a week or whatever is probably a lot less boring and a lot more relaxing than making one cutting board a minute. When you need to make one cutting board a minute in order to make a living, the work becomes extremely monotonous because that kind of efficiency can only be realized through specialization. You will no longer be designing and carving and staining the whole board yourself soup to nuts. That's a lot of different kinds of work within one job. When you shift to mass production, all of a sudden, the only thing you do is send the wood through the planer or the jointer or whatever. I don't know wood. <laughs> All you do is monitor the computer that's monitoring the viscosity of the stain that the robot is spraying on or whatever. That's all you do. These are the differences between knitting socks and working in a sock factory. Now, I am not one of these... The Industrial Revolution has been a disaster for the human race, asshats. But there is something to be said for a life in which you get to do lots of different things in a day. And a mutually exclusive relationship does exist between variety and efficiency. One usually comes at the expense of the other. I imagine that I would rather be a subsistence farmer than work in a sock factory. But I trust that there's a reason that most people, when actually presented with that choice, choose the sock factory. Point is, hobbies and jobs both involve work, but your job will probably always feel like your job, no matter how much your job resembles a hobby. Indeed, fun jobs are usually much more competitive than other kinds of jobs, and so you usually have to work a lot harder to get and to keep a fun job, because everybody else wants your job. When Gwyneth Paltrow says that acting in movies is harder than working in an office, she's not totally insane. Like, film sets really are particularly grueling workplaces. The difference is that Gwyneth can make enough money with one movie to never have to work a day in her life again. You can endure all kinds of torment for a few months, as long as you know it's going to put you on easy street thereafter. 
still doesn't mean the work isn't hard. Hollywood actors work insanely hard, and most of them don't make near as much money as Gwyneth Paltrow. This is why labor unions are so important in the media industry. These are jobs that millions of people would work for free, literally free. Think of all the people who would gladly give up a year of their lives for free to star in a movie for no pay at all. There are probably people who would pay a fortune to be in a movie. In that environment, where people are willing to do your job for free, it's very hard to get paid fairly and to demand tolerable working conditions unless you're a member of a big, powerful union. So, solidarity to all of my striking friends in SAG-AFTRA and the WGA. I'm worried about you and your industry. I'm worried that you're fighting for money that increasingly just isn't there. But as long as some loathsome corporate rent seekers are getting rich off of your creative work, I support you in fighting for every dollar. And hey, friends in the prestige restaurant industry, y'all need a union. I mean, food service workers have unions in in the states that are not hostile to unions. But chefs need unions, too. Like, being a big-time chef has recently become one of these desirable jobs that some people would do for free just to live their dream or whatever. It's awfully hard to secure fair working conditions in those circumstances. Ask everybody in Hollywood. The problem, of course, is that, you know... Movie studios are giant institutions that may live on for centuries. Restaurants are tiny companies that flicker in and out of existence like insects, and it generally takes at least a year to unionize a workplace, by which time everybody involved might be on to the next restaurant, and that's one of many reasons why it's hard to unionize restaurants in the current regulatory climate. But let's remember that the current regulatory climate is a human creation. We can make of it what we wish. Anyway, the point is, a job is always a job. I like my job. I love my job. But if this were my hobby, I would not do it nearly as much. I would probably make a wider variety of media products than I do now, and I definitely would not be editing in the car on the way to Florida, because I get super car sick when I look down in the car. I would never do that for fun. I did it because I had to. So the fact that I was kind of miserable on that drive to my dream vacation, it didn't really disquiet my soul at all. I understand that pleasure must be purchased with pain. You can endure so much pain if you believe that you are purchasing pleasure with it. That's what working and saving up for a vacation is. That's what shelling shrimp for dinner is. I mean, I like shelling shrimp just like I like my job, but I wouldn't shell and devein too many shrimp simply for fun. I'd do it because I like to eat shrimp. If you have any impulse control at all, you are fine purchasing pleasure with pain. You are fine doing things you don't want to do in exchange for the promise of something else in your future. We'll get back to what that something is, but here's what I feel I have realized lately on an intuitive level. Your job and all the things that you do that you don't really want to do, all of that becomes a bag into which you can stow all of your bad feelings, even those feelings that have nothing to do with your job or any of your other obligations. Your obligations become your scapegoat, which is literally an escaped goat. If you've ever wondered where that word comes from, scape in this context is an archaic English noun for the act of escaping or getting away. Scapegoat is a compound noun meaning escaped goat. In the book of Leviticus, Aaron takes two little goats that presumably would have otherwise been used by the Israelites for milk, meat, wool, or leather. 
Aaron takes one of these pure, innocent little goats and he sacrifices it to his God. The good goat goes to God. Great. The other goat, Aaron symbolically invests with all of the sins of all of the people of Israel. Everything bad that everybody ever did now gets blamed on this one goat. And that goat, Aaron simply releases into the wilderness like throwing trash into a dump. That's the escaped goat. A perfectly good goat that you really rather would have eaten, but you figure, hey, if this goat can carry away all of your sins and bad feelings, then write off the loss. You know what I mean? That's a good deal. You know what else is a good deal? Trade Coffee, sponsor of this episode. Get a free bag of coffee with any subscription purchase at drinktrade.com slash adamshow. I mean, if you wanted to instead, you could constantly wander around the United States tasting hundreds of coffees from hundreds of independent roasters to find the very best stuff suited to your particular tastes. But, you know, that would probably cost a lot of money. And you'd spend a lot of it on coffee that you wouldn't even really like. So take Trade's deal instead. You tell them what kind of coffee you like and how fast you go through it. And then Trade puts you on a subscription where new and delightful fresh roasts just show up at your door on the regular. And Trade does the work of tasting everything for you in advance. I mean, they don't taste your particular bag. That would be weird. But people at Trade have tasted other bags of that particular coffee many times, and they've determined that it's good enough for you. Trade always keeps a stable of some 450 coffees of different styles ready to go whenever you want them. And whatever you're into, they can connect you with it. The coffee itself doesn't come from Trade. It's roasted by the local independent roaster, wherever they are. And within 48 hours of being roasted, the bag ships to you in a compostable red Trade outer bag. Wow, does coffee taste better when it is fresh roasted. And for me, the best thing about Trade's deal is the variety and the serendipity. I never know exactly what's coming. I know that it's going to be probably a lighter roast, which is what I prefer. But other than that, I'm kind of down for whatever. And Trade sends me coffees that surprise and delight me. I have learned about coffee and I've learned about my relationship with coffee through my relationship with trade. Start your own relationship with trade. Get a free bag of coffee with any subscription right now at drinktrade.com slash Adam show. Remember the show part. If you want to support the Ragusia podcast specifically, which could definitely use your support drinktrade.com slash Adam show. Get that free bag at drinktrade.com slash Adam show. Thank you, Trade. Good deal. Scapegoats were also a good deal, as told in the Torah. You put all your sins and your bad feelings or whatever into a random goat, and you just then let that goat escape into the wild. Done and dusted. My whole life, my job has been my scapegoat. And before I had a job, school was my scapegoat. My obligations, all the things that I did because I had to do, not because I wanted to. These things have been my escaped goat. Anything bad going on in my life, any bad feelings that I had, I blamed on my obligations. Yeah, I'm home and I'm theoretically relaxing right now, but I'm still depressed and stressed out. And the reason for that is because I know that I have to go make MTOs at Sheets all day tomorrow or because I know I have to go do an awkward and scary meeting with my department head at the university or whatever it was, you know? Driving in that car to Florida last week, I was anxious and kind of glum. And above all else, I was very physically uncomfortable. And I figured, hey, that's just fine. I felt bad because I was doing my job, editing in the car. And a job is a job, even when it's your dream job. And I felt bad because I was trapped in a car for eight hours. No problem. No problem. I'm fine doing things I don't want to do in exchange for the promise of something else in my future. Like 
maybe hanging out on a pristine white sand beach in July with my beautiful wife and children? Like, that sounds pretty good, right? But then you get there, and there's more obligations. You got to unload the car. You got to carry all the bags up to the room. You got to put everything away. You got to wriggle the kids into their swimsuits. You got to butter them up with sunscreen without getting it in their eyes and making them cry. And honestly, none of this is terribly relaxing yet. One of the best pieces of advice we ever got as new parents years ago was... Somebody told us that it's not a vacation. It's a trip. Vacations are supposed to be relaxing. Trips may be fun, but they are not necessarily relaxing. And no trip with a young child is ever terribly relaxing. Don't expect it to be a vacation. Expect it to be a trip. So to me, the best part of this Florida trip that we do every year is when I've gotten everybody in bed, I've had a shower, so there's no more sand in my nether regions or whatever. <laughs> All near-term obligations have been satisfied, and I saunter out to the upper floor balcony in this rental condo overlooking the awesome breadth and power of the Gulf of Mexico as it laps like bath water against the white sands beneath me. I lie back on this couch out on this balcony and I clutch my phone as it plays the audiobook of Face the Music, A Life Exposed by Paul Stanley, the guy from KISS. For some reason, this has been my tradition for at least Five years running now? Don't ask me why or how it got started, but my happy place is sitting on that balcony, eating frozen Rolos, listening to the Star Child talk in his lispy Queen's accent about all the broads he nailed in 1975. I'm a simple man. I nestled into that happy place last week, and I thought, now... Finally, the good part. This is what it's all about. This is what everything else was leading up to. This is when I can finally unclench. This is the pleasure that I purchased with all that pain. I worked insanely hard my whole life. I got real lucky a few times, and I worked even harder to capitalize on that luck. And now I can do anything I want within reason. And with that freedom, I have chosen to come here to this indoor-outdoor sofa hovering five stories above the emerald coast of Florida. And I'm listening to Paul Stanley tell me about the young woman who worked at the reception desk at the recording studio who would buzz you through like a, a double door security checkpoint. And whenever Paul was bored recording, he'd come visit this receptionist and she'd lock the two of them together between those double security doors. And Paul reflects, I had no illusions that I was the only one, but I was one. I'm in my happy place on the balcony. This is it. This is what it's all about. And how do I feel? I don't know. My butt kind of hurts. Like I was sitting in the car all day, and now I'm relaxing by the beach, which generally involves more sitting. And honestly, my butt is sore. And in the absence of any more important problems to consider, the soreness of one's butt becomes a surprisingly consuming discomfort. My butt is sore, and I got that video done, but I still haven't gotten sponsor approval yet, and gosh, what if they want some big changes to the ad? I'm in Florida, and most of my gear is up in Tennessee. Ah, oh, well, who cares, you know? I'm a... A modestly wealthy man now. I don't need this sponsor. I don't need any one sponsor. That's why sponsors can't bully me around into saying stuff that I'm quite sure is false. I can let an individual deal go. I do it all the time for all kinds of reasons. Yeah. 
But it'd be a real D move for me to back out of a contract with two days to go, right? I shouldn't do that. And really, the person I'd be hurting is Colin, who'd have to call the brand and tell them that Adam Ragusea is flaking out on the deal because he's in Florida and he can't be bothered to reshoot the ad. Eh, probably best for everyone if I just do the work, even if I don't need the money. And I did the work already before I left Tennessee. The sponsor hasn't even asked me to reshoot the ad. I'm just irrationally worried that they might ask me to reshoot the ad while I'm down here in Florida. Wait, did Paul just talk about the, the receptionist and the security doors? Damn it, that's my favorite part. These frozen Rolos aren't really frozen anymore. They've been out on the balcony warming up. And now they're more like refrigerated Rolos, which are still good and chewy, but they don't like shatter when you crunch them the way that frozen Rolos do. I should really put the bag back in the freezer to chill. Oh, but then I'd have to get up again. And I just found this comfortable position on my side that doesn't make my butt hurt. I don't feel very relaxed. When do I get my perfect moment? When do I get my reward? What is all of this for? Where is the unmitigated pleasure I have purchased with a lifetime of pain? Dear listener, you may think that this is the internal monologue of a deeply spoiled person, and you may be right, but I also suspect that you would feel somewhat similarly in my position. I mean, I don't know that you would. People are very diverse. But it's rather like the people who criticize a famous person for being thin-skinned. Like, most famous people get criticized for being thin-skinned. It might be that thin-skinned people are more likely to become famous. Insecurity might motivate you to work hard and achieve things that earn you public adulation to assuage your insecurity. But I think it's just as likely that being famous makes you thin-skinned, or rather, it makes you appear thin-skinned to people who don't know what it feels like to be famous. Even low-scale internet micro-celebrity opens up a floodgate of unsolicited comments about your personality and your appearance and everything else about you from people who do not see you as a fellow human being. Rather, they see you as an object in a store to be scrutinized before being bought or sold or left behind in the bin. I suspect you would appear thin-skinned if you were suddenly subjected to that torrent of judgment. You probably end up growing far thicker skin than most other people who aren't famous, but when they see you occasionally get cagey with the mob that has surrounded you, they say, wow, so thin-skinned. I suspect that most of you in my position might also appear thin-skinned and spoiled. But actually, I don't think that I'm spoiled, because my definition of spoiled requires some lack of self-awareness. Like a spoiled person doesn't know how good they have it. There are many things I don't know, but I know how good I have it. It's good to be able to go to the beach with your family. But it's bad when you get there, and everything is perfect as any mortal could reasonably expect but it still doesn't feel like the reward at the end of the journey. You still feel like you're on the journey, humping it in your 80-pound hiking pack. The whole time, you're fantasizing about the sweet release of laying that pack on the ground, but it turns out the pack is actually sewn to your skin, and you can never put it down. You will never put it down. There is no rest at the end of the journey. That's a horrifying realization to have on that balcony, or wherever and whenever it strikes you. I hope that you're lucky enough in your life to one day suffer this crushing epiphany that can only come when you have cleared every obvious barrier out of the way of your life. It's a good problem to have. And now I must wonder if I really have 
cleared every obvious barrier out of the way of my life. Maybe I have other problems yet to solve. Undiagnosed problems. I mean, a few jerks on the internet will probably try to claim that I am unhappy with my wife and my family because my wife sometimes appears on the internet with me. And for some reason, people presume to know everything about a long-term intimate relationship based on a tiny scrap of it that unfolded on camera. You know nothing. You know nothing about my relationship and I know nothing about yours. There are only two people locked between those security doors, and only they know what really happens there. You know nothing about other people's relationships, and they know nothing about yours. You don't have to take my word for it, but if you are so inclined, my marriage is awesome. Hasn't always been awesome. It won't always be awesome. There will be times today when my marriage is not awesome. But we've been at this for 16 years now, and we're getting better all the time. Life is long, and it's amazing how good you can get at life if you just don't ever stop learning and improving. My marriage is rad. My kids are rad, even though I want to drive them into the sea sometimes. Every parent wants to drive their kids into the sea sometimes, and it's kind of surprising how few of them actually do it. And as difficult and complicated as my life with kids is, it's a thousand times richer and more meaningful to me than my old life without kids. Other people on the internet will say, Adam, the reason that you feel like you can't ever truly relax is because you have an anxiety disorder. Get thee to a nunnery. They have therapies for this, dude. Fair. True. Though, you don't know what help I have or have not sought for my problems, and there are things that I don't intend to tell you about. But, 100%, if you feel like you can never put your pack down, I support you in seeking treatment. I am not here to convince you that all the pain you feel is inherent to life, and you must simply accept it. There is no good part. I'm not trying to tell you that. I am trying to tell you to buy some delicious, refreshing element. Sponsor of this episode. Get a free flavor sample pack with any purchase at drinklmnt.com slash Adam. Element is spelled L-M-N-T. Drinklmnt.com slash Adam. Element is sort of a next level electrolyte drink mix that you just pour out of its little pouch and it dissolves rapidly in water. And when you drink it, it is not only delicious, I've got the uh, limited edition summer grapefruit flavor here. Mm. It is not only delicious, but it helps you stay hydrated in the heat quite a lot better than plain water, actually. If you're sweating a lot due to heat or extended physical effort, you're gonna lose sodium in your sweat. And without enough sodium, your body essentially cannot hang on to the water that you drink. It's like trying to water a potted plant that's super dry, so the soil can't hold the water. It just falls right out the other end. The effect is kind of similar in humans. That's why athletes used to take salt tablets, and then they started drinking sports drinks. The problem with sports drinks on the market is that they are just full of sugar and other junk that you might not want. Plus, they taste like a child's juicy drink, and I'm a grown-up. Give me my grapefruit salt. Element is zero sugar hydration. You might be exercising in the heat precisely because you are trying to burn calories and you don't want to drink more of them as you replenish your electrolytes. Also, if you're not exercising but you're following like a really strict diet, you could get low on sodium and end up with muscle cramps and headaches and all kinds of problems because most people in the developed world get most of their sodium from ultra-processed foods that you might be cutting out on your diet. I sweat an awful lot all the time, really. But I sweat an awful lot when I was down in Florida. Did I drink much element when I was down in Florida? No, because I was also eating super salty fried seafood the whole time. Now that I'm sweating up in Tennessee again, I'm eating much better, and that's good, 
But I'm also drinking some Element after a few hours gardening in the sun, because otherwise I'm not going to get my electrolytes. Element has a research-backed ratio of sodium to other important electrolytes like magnesium. It's tasty AF, right? Especially the grapefruit flavor that is back for the summer right now. Buy some and uh, try lots of other great flavors for free in a free sample pack that you can get with any purchase at drinklmnt.com slash Adam. You can only get that deal with a link like the one that I have. drinklmnt.com slash Adam. Thank you, Element. Anyway, my life is awesome, but it's probably not as problem-free as I believe it to be, and some of those unacknowledged problems may be responsible for the bad feelings I feel when everything else in my life seems to be awesome. I am open to this possibility. Someone else on the internet is going to say, Adam, you're clearly on the spectrum. You have obvious sensory processing issues, as evidenced by your weird obsession with texture in your cooking and your weird hang-ups about clothes. Fair. True. Maybe. Lauren certainly agrees with you. Having been very close to neurodivergent people in my life, I am hesitant to apply any such label to myself, even if I could find a doctor to apply it to me. I think that I'm a very normal person in the scheme of all humanity. I do wonder if I have some tactile sensation processing issues. I am physically uncomfortable, to one extent or another, every minute of every day. And that's a problem that gets worse when I'm relaxing or trying to relax. And when I'm working, I'm distracted from my physical discomfort. But when I try to relax for the good part of life that I am presumably always working toward, I become much more aware of my low-level physical discomfort, which is constant. I don't know about you, But I never feel all the way physically right. Especially as I get older, my butt and my back and my joints just hurt at least a little all the time. I feel like I can't get all the way comfortable anymore, ever. I feel like my mouth always tastes a little bad or weird and I find myself flossing more than is probably called for or I find myself eating stuff that I don't even really want that much just to taste something different in there. My stomach usually hurts at least a little. Sometimes I eat something just to have a different feeling in there. I hate how my clothes feel on me. They're always bunching up in weird ways. Or if I wear them large enough that they don't bunch up, I feel like I'm wearing a circus tent. I feel like no clothes actually fit my body. And I still don't know if that's the fault of my body or if it's the fault of clothes and how they are designed for idealized bodies that don't actually exist. I don't know to what extent this constant discomfort with my clothes is the result of actual tactile sensations versus like terrible social conditioning that makes me ashamed of my body, no matter how lean it is or isn't at any given time. I do find that when I'm leaner than I am now, I am much less physically uncomfortable all the time, and I don't feel like I'm fighting against my clothes all the time, but I don't think I know myself well enough to know if those are real tactile sensations or if they're just fat-shaming emotions that I am projecting onto my tactile sensations. I suspect it's both, by the way. This is an unpopular thing to say in the year 2023, but I still believe that the human body is evolved to be leaner most of the time than most of us in the developed world are these days. This basic musculoskeletal structure that we all have is calibrated to support a smaller, lighter body at least most of the year. And it just works better at a body fat percentage between maybe... 10 and 20% for a man like me. I'm probably more like 25% body fat right now, and I doubt all of these bad feelings that flow from my body size are purely tactile. I think a lot of it is socially enforced shame that I fully internalized long ago. 
I am open to the possibility that my life is not as problem-free as it appears. I may simply have cleared all of the external obstructions while neglecting my internal ones. Maybe. Whether it's legitimate or not, the thought has occurred to me that I might finally be happy and physically comfortable if I was pretty skinny. I'm not going to lie, I think I am consistently happier and more comfortable when I'm leaner than I am now. I think that's a combination of legitimate physiological factors and illegitimate social factors. By illegitimate, I mean it's a bullshit social stigma that shouldn't exist, but it does. And I'm probably more deeply indoctrinated in that stigma than you are, because odds are you are younger than me, and our society has gotten a lot better about this in recent years. When I was a kid, nobody thought twice before telling you that you're fat and you need to lose weight. Now, people still tell you that you're fat and you need to lose weight, but they often think twice before saying it. And that's progress for you and those younger. But for old man Ragusia, I'm hopeless, man. He's hopeless. I don't think that I will ever be deprogrammed of fat shaming. That bullshit was seared into my gray matter in a department store changing room when I was 11. It may be that the easiest way I have of relieving this pain now is to simply lose weight, which I probably will, and then I'll probably gain it back again, and then I'll lose it again, and then I'll gain it back again, and at some point I'll die. I think this is why rich people appear to be more neurotic than normal people. A, rich people have the time and energy to think and talk about their neuroses way more. And B, you become more aware of your neuroses when all of your other problems have wandered off into the wilderness with that goat. And you can no longer blame any of your bad feelings on something external. It's all you now, bud. So, here are my conclusions. These conclusions are personal to me, but potentially applicable to you, and perhaps they are universal truths. I have no idea. Conclusion number one is, my life probably isn't as problem-free as I think it is. I have unresolved internal problems and probably a few unresolved external problems, the existence of which I refuse to acknowledge to myself, let alone you. And some things about life just suck. No amount of money makes travel not suck. Eight hours in a luxury SUV is way better than eight hours in a cattle car, but it still sucks. Travel always sucks. No amount of money saves you from feeling insecure when you're younger. And no amount of money keeps your knees from aching as you get older. No amount of money fully insulates you from tragedy or the constant threat of tragedy because the same night awaits us all. My life probably isn't as problem-free as I think it is. Therefore, Lots of my bad feelings may still be attributable to external problems and not just to my broken soul. Conclusion number two is the human perceptual system can probably only process some mixture of good and bad feelings. I'm pretty sure that it can't only feel good things, and I suspect that it can't only feel bad things, at least not over any extended period of time. We have reward systems built into our brains, stacks of carrots and sticks in our brains, and you can never fully exercise the sticks in favor of the carrots. Side note, what is the stick in that figure of speech? I get that it's a metaphor about driving your mule to market or something. The carrot is the reward that you offer for positive reinforcement. Is the stick the threat that you use for negative reinforcement? Like, move mule, or I'm going to hit you with this stick. Or is it like the Warner Brothers cartoons that I watched growing up, where Bugs Bunny would tie the carrot to the end of a stick 
and dangle it in front of the mule so that the mule believes that it is constantly walking toward the carrot that it wants, and that's why it willingly walks all the way to the market. Which kind of stick is it? This is one of those things that I have wondered since before Google existed, and therefore it's never really occurred to me to use Google to figure it out the way that I figure out almost everything else in my life now. Another one of those is whether it's better to run your card as credit or debit. I've wondered that since before the internet really existed, and therefore it never occurs to me to use the internet to get an answer, and now I kind of don't want to know. I've made it this far, don't tell me. Anyway, conclusion number two is that the brain has a big stack of carrots and sticks, neurochemicals that make you feel good to reward you, and neurochemicals that make you feel bad to punish you. We evolved these neurochemicals to prompt us to behave in ways that enhance our reproductive success, which is all that the forces of evolution really care about. You can go through a life dominated by the carrot chemicals or the stick chemicals, but they're all in there all the time and you cannot escape them. Indeed, the carrots may depend on the sticks and vice versa. These chemicals exist in delicate balance with each other. If you do something that spikes your dopamine levels, you may feel totally awesome for a time, but if your dopamine is chronically high, See what I did there? Chronically high? If your dopamine is chronically high, then your brain starts to close off dopamine receptors to compensate. And then if you stop doing whatever it is that you're doing that spikes your dopamine, you suddenly find yourself with less dopamine and fewer active receptors to receive it. You crash and you get depressed. I'm sure that's an obscene oversimplification of what's going on, but I know enough about brain science to suspect that a certain floor of bad feeling is baked into the cake up here. You will feel at least a little bad about something some of the time. And when you live a charmed life with no obvious problems, this might lead you to get irrationally upset about minor inconveniences or perceived slights. This might be one reason among many why rich people seem to be a-holes. We all have a certain quota of bad feelings, and if you can't spend that quota on a real problem, you're going to spend it on a fake problem, like, I'm at the beach, but my butt hurts. This leads me to conclusion number three. I need to find some real problems. I'm not proposing to blow up my life just so that I can put it together again. Rich people whom I admire concern themselves with the problems of others, and I suspect this is one reason why. They're going to feel 20 or 30% bad in a, any given day, no matter what happens. So, they choose to get mad or sad about the pain and injustice suffered by most other humans, and they work to resolve those problems for their fellow humans, thus opening up a whole new pathway of dopamine release, or whatever happy chemical you get by doing a good deed. I don't know which one it is. This unfortunately opens up the door to a lot of paternalism on the part of rich people, and I don't have any solutions for that right now. Even a man such as this can only accomplish so much in a single podcast episode, people. Conclusion number four. Relaxation is not the highest form of pleasure. This probably seems obvious to anyone who has ever eaten a delicious meal or had sex. I've done both things. Multiple times, even. But I, I still must be reminded that the greatest heights of enjoyment are reached not in a relaxed state, but in an aroused state. You are not relaxed when you eat. Hunger and thirst induce states of emotional and physical arousal that drive you to eat, and eating leads rapidly to digestion, which is a very energy-intensive process that your body really has to 
hype itself up for. When you've eaten a giant meal and you go and lay on the couch and you feel like you are, you're not relaxing, but you're still kind of like working to digest your food, that's because you are. Relaxation is great, but really only in contrast to exertion. Being relaxed all the time actually feels kind of awful. Gen Z kids on TikTok have apparently just discovered this phenomenon for themselves, as all generations do, and they've called it bed rot. The idea of spending all day in bed sounds awesome, but usually doesn't feel good. I've been in bed all day myself today. And by myself, I mean the version of me that is writing these notes several hours before I plan to perform this podcast episode in the greenhouse. <laughs> the version of me that's writing this several hours ago has been in bed writing all day, and that guy feels physically and emotionally bad. He's going to finish this up, go in the garage, and after one single set of heavy squats, he's going to get a giant endorphin release or whatever, and he's going to instantly feel way more pleasure than he ever could have felt by, quote unquote, relaxing all day. Food only tastes really good when you're hungry, and relaxation only feels really good when you are exercised in some way. It's like we were talking about in last week's pod with dairy farmer Manjeet, we were talking about animal welfare, and Manjeet pointed out the obvious that humans cannot fully know the mind of cattle, what little mind they have, and therefore we cannot know exactly how cattle would like to be treated by farmers. But Manjeet also pointed out something less obvious, which is that the cattle themselves might not know what makes them happy. I mean, people are like 10 million times smarter than cows. But even people don't always know what actually makes them happy. Can you trust a cow to know what's in its best interests or to do what's in its best interests? Remember that cattle are not nature. We humans bred the entire species that is cattle out of a population of as few as 80 wild aurochs, which is an animal that doesn't even exist anymore but it probably resembled modern cattle about as much as a gray wolf resembles Pop-Tart, the one-year-old Labrador retriever. If I left Pop-Tart to her own devices, if I gave her run of the house right now to do whatever she want, she would chew through an electrical cable and shock herself, or she'd break into her like giant dog food Tupperware in the kitchen and eat until she threw up, and then she'd eat some more and throw up again. Pop-Tart doesn't know what's best for her own happiness. I don't know what's best for my own happiness, but I think my much greater intelligence and greater impulse control gives me some better idea of what's best for my own happiness. I know that set of squats that I'm going to go do will be miserable in the moment, and it will require a lot of motivation and self-control to get myself under that bar. But you have to feel at least a little bad to feel good. I'm pretty sure. A life with 100% good feelings is psychobiologically impossible as of press time. Conclusions number five and six. I don't have them, but I really wanted to make it to conclusion number seven because seven is a theologically significant number and this last point is about religion. Conclusion number seven. There's a reason that most of the world's great philosophical traditions slash religions emphasize balance as the key to happiness. Balancing charity with self-care. Balancing concern for the eternal life of the soul against concern for life on earth. Balancing obligations to the household versus community versus church versus the state. Balancing your planning for the future against living in the present. Balancing night and day and summer and winter and good and evil and male and female and everything in between or beyond. Balance is what it's all about in the world's great 
time-tested traditional ways of life. It took me 41 years to discover this wisdom on my own because the best and worst thing about me is that no one can teach me anything. I learn on my own. But the point is, you cannot set your helicopter down on the Caribbean island that is success and expect all of your bad feelings to cease and desist. You will always have bad feelings. You cannot spend your remaining days in a bathtub of pure pleasure. That tub doesn't exist. It's not for sale. Actual, sustainable happiness comes from maintaining a fine balance of good and bad feelings. And you achieve that balance by looking for those feelings in the right places. <laughs> I don't pretend to know where those places are, but here's one thing that I'm pretty sure of, because it's also a bit of ancestral wisdom that you'll find in every major philosophical tradition, and here it is. Journeys are more important than destinations. Duh, right? Sitting on that balcony on the Gulf Coast after everybody else has gone to bed and eating frozen Rolos, that's pretty damn good. I'm going to do that again next year and the year after that. But that's just the destination, and the journey is more important. Playing with the kids all day in the pool so that they would be good and tired and they'll actually go to sleep on time so I can actually get on the balcony with my Paul Stanley audiobook before it gets too late. Getting the kids down to Florida in the first place. Making the money that I spent getting us down there. Making all the videos and the podcasts and the recipes that I have made to make that money. And all the things that I learned and the friends that I made along the way and the people that I informed and entertained. That's the journey. So of course the destination feels underwhelming in contrast. The journey was hard and often unpleasant, but it mattered more. And the best feelings came along the way, not at the end. The good part is how you get to the good part. Therefore, a secret to happiness is to never stop the journey. You're like a shark. You can stop swimming when you die. The interests of the journey and the interests of the destination must be kept in optimal balance. They both matter, but the journey matters more. It doesn't matter how much this looks like paradise. If I stop trying to get to paradise this will eventually become a hell. Or at the very least, I will make it a hell for the people around me. So the journey must continue, and that is why there will be another episode of the Adam Ragusea podcast next week. Thanks for coming along for this one. Make good choices, and I'll talk to you next time.